The Tom Woods Show, episode 1192. Prepare to set fire to the index card of allowable opinion. Your daily dose of liberty education starts here. The Tom Woods Show. Folks, when you're on social media defending the libertarian position on health care, oh, you get called all kinds of fun names. Well, I've got just the antidote, my free ebook, Your Friends Are Wrong About Health Care. Check it out at yourfriendsarewrong.com. Hi, everybody. Tom Woods here talking to Murray Sabrin again today. Murray Sabrin is a professor of finance at Ramapo College. He's a tireless promoter of the ideas of liberty. He's got such a great personal story. There's so many good things to say about Murray. I've been really happy and privileged to know him for quite a few years now. He is running for U.S. Senate as a libertarian, and it's true, coming off the Libertarian Convention, I am a little bit in LP mode, I guess. I'm just interested in what's going on. But we're going to talk about much more than just an election. We'll talk about uh, quite a few things that are facing the country these days. So um, uh, next week, I'm also going to be talking to the leader of the Libertarian Party of Canada. And then we'll go on to other topics. But, you know, a lot of podcasters, when they were in town, were doing a bunch of interviews there. So in a way, in spirit, I'm doing the same thing, although I'm already back home uh, interviewing Murray from the, well, at that time, when I, I talked to him a few days ago, um, I was interviewing him from the ongoing convention. So uh, sabrinforsenate.com is the website. But in general, you just got to love Murray Sabrin. There is really nobody else like him. <laughs> Murray, welcome back. Well, thank you, Tom. It's a pleasure being with you. I always enjoy uh, speaking with you since um, you're one of the shining lights of the libertarian movement, uh, which I've been involved with since now the early 70s. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you very much. We had an opportunity to talk to you very briefly on the most recent episode of Contra Krugman, and now I want to have a little bit more time with you. And one of the questions I asked you there, I'd like to uh, repeat, actually, but I'm going to phrase it a little bit differently. You've been a professor of finance for over 30 years, and what I want to know is, as a professor of finance, what knowledge do you have that your opponents do not have that is relevant to the American public when it comes time to choosing a senator? Well, I've been teaching uh, corporate finance one, securities and investments, and my new course, Financial History of the United States, which, by the way, I've been using all the Austrian school material uh, from your article about the, the Continentals to uh, Bob Murphy to Rothbard to Salerno, and students get a real appreciation of the evolution of money and banking in the United States. And why that's important is because we live in a post-gold standard world. President Nixon got rid of the gold standard in 1971, so we're living in this fiat world, and the recessions and the business cycles have gotten worse and worse because of that. So I bring to the campaign, to the United States Senate, an appreciation and the, the uh, causes, the underlying causes of the ups and downs of the economy, which caused so much pain in uh, parts of the country where it's devastated communities, it's destabilized uh, uh, businesses, it's led to uh, incredible distortions in the economy, and people are anxious, even though we supposedly have a good economy where the stock market's near an all-time high, where the housing market is just booming, uh, there's, there's a shortage of workers, uh, according to uh, reports. There are more jobs available than people looking for work, which shows you the tremendous economic boom that's underway. But the question is, are these really good, sustainable jobs, or is it just because of the easy money that we've had since 2008 when the financial crisis hit? So what I can bring to the table is explain to people that the Federal Reserve has been manipulating interest rates since it was created, and therefore it destabilizes the economy rather than having a free market, which gives a sustainable prosperity. What's your personal background, and how does it help to account for who you are today? Well, I was an undergraduate history major with a geography minor plus a concentration in social studies education because I sought to be a social studies teacher in the New York City school system. But after a couple of years, I realized this was not going to be my future because there was no really intellectual stimulation at the intermediate school in New York City. So I got my master's in social studies education while I was teaching, and then I uh, applied to Rutgers and got into the PhD program in the geography department because my goal was to be a geography professor. And lo and behold, I came across the Austrian school in the early 1970s when I read Murray Rothbard's 1971 essay criticizing uh, President Nixon's wage price controls. And that was, I was really curious about how this was going to impact the U.S. economy. And so when I got to graduate school, I was 
originally was going to write a dissertation on how uh, transportation in the urban uh, urban areas were, were affected by the price structure of fares. But I found that pretty boring, and then I came across the whole literature on how money diffuses through the economy, which the Austrians explained beautifully in What Has the Government Done to Our Money, and Mises explained it in the theory of money credit. And I said, this would be an interesting topic. How does money enter the system through the Federal Reserve, through the banking system, and then affects local economies in terms of prices of production? And I invited Murray Rothbard to be an outside member of my dissertation committee, and uh, I got my dissertation at Rutgers in 1981. And uh, in 1985, I started teaching uh, finance and economics and solely finance for the last 30 years. And it's been a great experience to train people, not only in basic corporate finance, but explain to them how the business cycle will affect businesses and that they should be prepared for the downturn that, that is inevitable once we have this unsustainable boom. So my journey has been a wonderful journey of, from a curious uh, undergraduate to uh, to college professor, and now I'm running for the U.S. Senate on the Libertarian ticket, uh, which I did in 1997 as governor when we made political history by raising enough funds to get matching grants from the state government, because that was the process back then. And the goal was to be in the debates, which I did with uh, three debates with uh, Governor Whitman and Jim McGreevy. And a lot of things that we did during that campaign came into law, like the 65 speed limit, like auto insurance uh, deregulation, which happened under a Democrat administration, by the way. And the other thing that I did, which was part of case, which is now part of case law in the state of New Jersey, is uh, I was in violation of a code in my town which said you could not put political signs in your own lawn a violation of property rights and free speech. So we went to court and the judge immediately threw out the ordinance to announce part of case law in New Jersey that a house owner, a homeowner, can put a political sign on their own lawn. So uh, so even though we didn't win, we had a, uh, an impact on public policy in New Jersey, which saved drivers hundreds of millions of dollars in uh, no fines and uh, lower auto insurance uh, premiums. So even though you don't have to win to have a real impact on public policy, but this, I think we're going to have a major impact because if we raise sufficient funds, we will be recognized by the media as a competitor with the two major parties, and that will get us into the debates and will be in the polling, and uh, we can make the case of how we can make America a much better economy, a stronger economy, by getting rid of the military industrial complex by the welfare state, phase that out, and point out to people that the best way to handle problems is at the local level. So what are my initiatives? which, by the way, is being embraced by people across the political spectrum as I go around the state and explain to people that if we have 100% tax credit for contributions to nonprofits, including houses of worship, which do great uh, social welfare programs, we can phase out the welfare state, and this would allow people in the community to become financially independent. And I think that's what everybody wants for themselves, for their family, that they don't have to rely on the government, which means the taxpayers, to get their basic necessities of life, and we have a lot more opportunity as we deregulate the economy and cut taxes. And the missing piece of this whole puzzle is we've got to reduce spending. And my tax proposal will start the ball rolling, I believe, by cutting spending because the federal government will no longer have to give these grants to hospitals and other nonprofits because that money will have to be raised locally as these organizations show that they're doing good work to people in the community who then will take their tax dollars, instead of having to pay Uncle Sam, they keep those tax dollars in Florida, in New Jersey, in Texas, wherever they are living, and help promote financial independence and help people get on their two feet if they're down on their luck. And that's what America was all about prior to the Great Depression. It was the beautiful aid societies that helped people when they were uh, had tough circumstances. So I think that message is resonating. The, uh, the libertarian message of uh, stop the domestic spying, stop the uh, endless wars, stop the, uh, the high taxation. And I think people appreciate it because I'm presenting in a way that's practical, that if we want good results, here's how you get good results. Let me go back just a minute. Do I understand you correctly that Rothbard was on your dissertation committee? Yes, I'm the only uh, – there are two people uh, where uh, Murray uh, served on Robert Bradley's dissertation committee and Murray Rothbard. I met him in 1974 – when I was um, going to invite him to be on my dissertation committee, because the at Rutgers you're allowed to bring in one outside member of the university, so I wrote him. I met him at the Brooklyn Polytech where he was teaching, and he was thrilled that there was an Austrian economic geographer in the, in the universe. 
And so um, he, he got me an invitation to the first Austrian economics conference in South Royalton. I roomed with Joe Salerno, who I didn't know before that, uh, and uh, we were both at Rutgers at the same time. And uh, Joe has become one of the great Austrian economists of all time. And um, I learned so much from Joe and other people who I've met over the years, Walter Block, Hans Hoppe, um, uh, Robert Murphy. You just go on down the list. And, of course, reading pieces at Rothbard and Hazlitt and Hayek. Um, I think I'm the only Austrian economic geographer in the country. You know, there are a lot of people, Murray, who say – I'm not interested in politics as a way of spreading liberty. I'm more interested in education. But your career has been very much in both. I mean, first of all, literally in education because you have been a college professor for quite some time. But also you've made documentaries. You have a lecture series at Ramapo College. You speak all over the place. You make media appearances. So you're always educating people in one way or another. But you also have the political angle here. How do you make the case to – and maybe you don't have to make the case because there aren't that many, frankly. There are a lot of people in, in our circles who feel this way, but in terms of the general public, not that many, who think that just being involved in the political process is some kind of a sellout of principle. How do you hit back on that? Well, I don't sell out on principle. I tell people what I believe in and what I explain, uh, Tom, to people is – I'm not imposing my personal views on people because if that was the case, I would ban smoking. I don't like smoking. I don't like to be around smokers, but I'm not imposing my personal lumps. What the point I make is what should the law be regarding issue A, B, C, or D? And of course, the issue is freedom. The issue is liberty. The issue is choice in terms of education, housing, uh, medical care, all the things that make life worth living. It involves people making choices unencumbered by government restrictions and barriers to trade and to other things, entry into businesses. And this is why that message is resonating, because uh, government stifles uh, uh, young people. One way it's stifling young people by the uh, student debt situation, which, by the way, is a big, big issue, as we all know. And it's really shameful that the government says you cannot discharge your student debt in bankruptcy. It's the only debt you cannot discharge. So that, to me, is a gross violation of equal protection under the law, that if you're having a difficult time paying your student debt, you should be able to discharge it during a bankruptcy proceeding. In addition, I just came across some information regarding Medicare that no one wants to talk about, mainly the explosion of, in Medicare premiums that's going to hit retirees and beneficiaries of the Medicare system over the next 20 years because premiums are scheduled to increase at much greater rate of, the, of inflation that's projected over the next 20 years. So there's going to be an explosion of premiums that uh, middle and upper income people are going to have to pay. No one's talking about it. I will be talking about it during this campaign. So my goal is to point out that government policies, and we use a wonderful term to describe government policies, that are counterproductive. They don't achieve the goals that the government wants, thinks it could achieve with intervention, whether it's high taxes, regulation, spending, you name it. Everything that the government does doesn't achieve its uh, goals. So therefore, what do we need to do? We need to rethink our view of the world regarding government action and talk about what the necessities talk about. Human action, free human action will address issues that will make life better for everyone except the people who want to live off the government, namely the taxpayer. I'm curious about how it is that today the Murray Sabrin, I guess I guess the Murray Sabrin I've always known, is somebody who is opposed to both the welfare and the warfare state. But yet in the – let's say back in the 60s, it would have been hard to find that many people who took that view. You'd find Rothbard. You'd find Leonard Liggio, a handful of others. But the conservative movement by and large was supporting the uh, war in Vietnam and the Cold War. But Rothbard took a pretty – hardline anti-interventionist position. And even in the 1990s, after the Cold War, you still see most of the conservative movement favoring foreign intervention. Were you always a dual opponent of the welfare warfare state, or did you start being anti-welfare and you came around? What was the intellectual evolution of Murray Sabrin in that regard? Very simple. I grew up in a Democratic household. My father was a blue-collar worker. He was a big fan of Adley Stevenson. In fact, he told me he made a donation of $5 to Adley Stevenson's presidential campaign in 1956 because he thought he was an intellect, a statesman, and my father was not an educated man in terms of schooling, but he was a very smart man. And so I grew up in, in the culture of New York City, which is basically um, left-wing or liberal, and so I embraced 
a mild welfare state. Remember, um, Medicare and Medicaid didn't come in until 1965 after I finished my first year of college, and we were promised by Johnson this would be a very minor cost program, and it would solve a lot of problems of the health care for the elderly and the poor. And, of course, it's exploded in price, it's, uh, in cost, and therefore it's, uh, it's counterproductive. The Vietnam War... Johnson said, the, the communists are coming. We better make sure that uh, we, we're in there to, to fight the communists. And uh, initially, I was uh, a mild proponent of the war. But by, by 1966, it was a disaster. And so by the late 60s, uh, after reading Rand and started reading Friedman and Newsweek about economics, uh, I realized that the whole welfare warfare state was a total disaster. And that's why I was in support of the Mises Institute when it was founded in 1982 and other free market organizations, uh, the Foundation for Economic Education, um, Jacob Hornberger's organization, the Future of Freedom Foundation. These organizations that are doing great work to educate the public about the counterproductive policies of uh, the welfare warfare state. And uh, I was a signatory to an ad that uh, Lou Rockwell put together for uh, the New York Times in 1991, I think it was, against the first Gulf War. I was happy to do it because I called my congressman for the second Gulf War, and I told my congressman, please don't vote for authorization because the intervention in Iraq was going to be a disaster. He voted for the authorization. It turned out to be a disaster. And I think about four or five years after he voted for the authorization, he wrote an op-ed in a local paper saying, I was wrong. I made a mistake by... Of voting for this authorization. So again, you point out to people, whether they're um, uh, public officials or uh, media people or editorial writers, economics is very simple. The law of supply and demand has to operate. We have, we have that free trade because that's the lifeblood of the world economy. We have to have sound money, not the Federal Reserve manipulating interest rates. We need to have our civil liberties protected. Uh, this last week was the 59th anniversary of becoming a U.S. citizen. I took an oath when I was 12 and a half. And I promised and swore to uphold the Constitution, particularly the Bill of Rights, all of the Bill of Rights, especially the Second Amendment, given my family's background. Uh, my father was a partisan uh, commander during World War II in his native Poland. Uh, he's the only one who survived World War II. Same thing with my mother. She's the only one who survived in her family. And so the right of self-defense to me is a fundamental human right. I don't even talk about the Second Amendment anymore. I just say the right of self-defense is a fundamental human right. And when you speak to liberals about this on talk shows that have been on panels, they tend to agree with me. In fact, what former county prosecutor said, uh, if everyone was a responsible gun owner as Murray Saber, he'd favor concealed carry in New Jersey. Uh, how about that? Um, let me ask you about the specifics of your campaign, because most of us don't live in New Jersey, for better or worse. And so we don't know who the other candidates are. Now, the temptation, I know you can go on forever and ever about these people. Right. Give us the, the, the short, punchy, why your opponents are particularly crummy speech. Well, you have Bob Menendez, a two-term incumbent who's a neocon Democrat who's wrong on all the issues, who's a federal lawbreaker, according to the Senate Ethics Committee, four-page letter, after there was a hung jury and uh, the feds couldn't nail him for all these transgressions. So you have Bob Menendez who... Uh, barely won his primary against uh, a candidate who had no money whatsoever. And the Republican is a former Big Pharma CEO who uh, basically has no platform. In fact, he's tried to plagiarize my platform by asking his um, his uh, stockbroker uh, from New Jersey, uh, to, who called Bob Wenzel, and to ask him what are Murray's three or four major issues. So Bob Ugin, who's the uh, CEO, uh, would adopt them so Murray could drop out of the race. So I have two very weak candidates. And Republicans are coming out of the woodwork to endorse me because they realize this guy is another Democrat because Bob Eugen six years ago donated to Bob Menendez, the neocon Democrat. So I've got two Bobs. There's no difference between them. So I'm running against really two candidates that represent the same ideology, big government. I don't know where Eugen stands on, on uh, war and peace issues, but that's the uh, nitty gritty of it, that I am the alternative to Bob Menendez, the logical, rational alternative to a big government Democrat who is bad on all the issues and basically is a career politician who's unethical. I mean, this is a dream race for a libertarian to run in. And that's why I hope people rally around my campaign in New Jersey and around the country. All right. Well, let me just be completely frank then. I'm going to ask the question that's on everybody's mind. And that is when you run as a libertarian, you can't possibly win. So what's the point of doing it? Now, I know that you could challenge the premise of that. That's true. So if you want to challenge the premise, feel free to do that. But even if you don't challenge the premise, I, I, I mean, either way, regardless of how you answer this, I want to hear both 
aspects of the question addressed because there can be good reasons to run even if the prospects for winning are not good. I mean, it's still good to get the message out and that sort of thing. Or, or it could be a good thing to run just to get a certain percentage because then that gets attention and then next time you, you start at a higher threshold and whatever. What is your strategic thinking about all this? Great question, Tom. And in order to win in a three-way race, obviously the mathematics says you, the minimum you need is 34%. Because 34% to the winner, 33% each for the second and third place uh, runner-ups. So that means 34% of the vote. That's a big call for a libertarian candidate. But in this race, you've got two very uh, weak candidates, in my opinion, because the Republican is, uh, has abandoned the conservative base of the Republican Party, the fiscal conservatives, the pro-lifers, the pro-Second Amendment people, so they're coming to our side. The Democrat speaks for himself. He's, he's a federal lawbreaker. So do the people of New Jersey want to uh, send to the Congress again, the United States Senate, a federal lawbreaker? So how do we win this thing? There's, there's really one path to victory, and that is if we raise enough funds, the media will take notes, and they'll write the narrative that it's a three-way race. Then the posters will include me in the uh, polls, and then the sponsors of the debates in the fall will include me in the debates. Once I'm in the debates, that's when I point out the, the flaws in Bob Menendez and Bob Hugan. And when people see the flaws of both of these candidates, they say, let's try something new. And I'm going to call for diversity. We have diversity all across the board. That's the big mantra in the United States. Diversity, diversity, diversity. Let's have the first libertarian elected U.S. senator. And besides, everyone talks about bipartisanship. Bipartisanship, let's have tripartisanship. Let's have Republicans and Democrats and the libertarian and all libertarians to really hammer out the issues and come to a consensus that we need to go to what my campaign slogan is, peace, liberty, prosperity. Now, everyone can agree with peace. Everyone can agree with prosperity. The question is, how do you get there? And people want their civil liberties protected, so we can get the civil liberties people on our side. So we're building this coalition of libertarians, conservatives, pro-lifers, pro-Second Amendment people, um, fiscal conservatives. Uh, and so I think there's an opportunity here to do what you need to win an election, is to build coalitions like Ron Paul said, on every issue, who are the people that are in favor of that issue? Let's go to them. Let's work with them and achieve that goal. That's what we're doing in this campaign. So I'm hoping that people will get this message and they'll uh, be able to rally around us in New Jersey and around the country. You, I assume, are probably trying to stay above any of the drama that's currently unfolding within the Libertarian Party. Well, yeah, I mean, I really don't know the players. I'm just here trying to promote my candidacy and let the internal politics of the LP take care of itself. Uh, but uh, my goal is to win the support of libertarians around the country, like we did in 1997 when we did a bailer, uh two weeks before we had to apply for our matching funds, and $150,000 came in in two weeks, which allowed us to get the matching funds, and uh, which required me to be in the debates. So we had a very robust campaign of uh, six weeks in uh, 1997. So this year, I'm trying to get uh, support from libertarians across the country like we did in 97. And if we do that, Tom, we have thresholds that we're trying to meet, the 500000 a million, and $2 million over the next uh, two, three months. And if we achieve that, then we will get the free media exposure. And as you know, that's valuable for a political candidate to, to be written about in every story, which will be virtually every day in, in, in September about the campaign. And that's how you convince people, I am the best alternative to Bob Menendez. And if we can achieve that objective, then anything is possible if you're, uh, the public perceives you as an alternative to Menendez, the incumbent, as opposed to just a gadfly candidate. And that's really what you have to uh, approach this race. You have to consider yourself a serious candidate, and that's where the resources come in, because then the media will say, yes, there's something happening. Given uh, Trump's victory, people got fed up and they voted for him. And look what happened in, in New York City, where this 28-year-old with, uh, who was outstepped 18 to 1 uh, defeated a 10-term incumbent. Who would have bet money on that race? And the polls had her down by 35%, and she won by 15 so anything is possible in politics, as we've seen, uh, Tom, because uh, uh, the voters are, are maybe not telling the pollsters the truth about how they feel. And therefore, there's a really subterranean vote out there that uh, we will try to tap into in, in, in New Jersey. All right, we're going to continue this awesome conversation after we hear from a sponsor I am very proud to feature. 
Folks, if you're like me, you love to read, but you have more than you can possibly handle. Plus, I like to read business and marketing books these days, and frankly, 90% of those books are fluff. I don't have time for that. Well, our sponsor, Blinkist, has solved this problem. Blinkist is the only app that takes thousands of the best-selling nonfiction books and distills them down to the critical information you must know, so you can read or listen to them in under 15 minutes all on your phone. I'm always driving our five daughters one place or another, and on my way back, I'm listening to Blinkist in the car. The Blinkist library is massive, from timeless classics like Think and Grow Rich to current bestsellers like Skin in the Game. My personal recommendation is to check out Will It Fly by Pat Flynn. It's a great little book that helps you figure out whether you should pursue a business idea. It saves you the time and trouble of pursuing one that isn't going to pan out. Right now, Blinkist has a special offer just for our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan when you join today. That's Blinkist, spelled B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T, Blinkist.com slash Woods to start your free trial or get three months off your yearly plan. Blinkist.com slash Woods. Let me say one thing here, Murray, on your behalf. I've known you for quite a while. In fact, back in probably, I guess it was 2008, 10 years ago, I donated the max to your campaign and I flew, I was living in Auburn, Alabama at that time. I flew up to New York to do a rally for you and then came back the same day, be back with the family. So I know Murray Sabrin, okay? Murray Sabrin is a friend of mine, <laughs> that sort of thing. <laughs> well, let, let me tell you something about, about Murray and in telling you that, I, I want to tell you something about my policy on this show. For a long time, I didn't have office seekers on the show at all of any sort. And I would just say, sorry, I just don't do that. I would have maybe incumbents like Ron Paul. I'm not going to not have Ron Paul on the show. But then I I did modify this. Bit. It was, first of all, I was afraid every office seeker in the world would want to come on my show. And then what, you know, that's not interesting for people. But so then I made my policy. I will occasionally have an office seeker on if it's somebody I know personally, I, somebody I can vouch for, because I don't want some shyster coming on the show trying to get support for his campaign. He turns out to be a bum. But I know, I mean, for crying out loud, you had, I did not know till today, you had Murray Rothbard on your dissertation committee. I, I dare say, given that we know there are only two such people, and the other one's Robert Bradley of the Institute for Energy Research, you are the only politician in history who can say that. So I can tell you, I have supported Murray both financially and in other ways, uh, in advocacy. And so if you support Murray, you know it's going to a good cause. It's going to a good man who will spend it wisely, who will be spreading our message, who's uncompromising, and who's just all around an extremely sweet and unflappable guy. I have never seen Murray snap at anybody. I've never seen him lose control of his of his emotions or get angry. Um, he has a very, very good image to the public. I mean, he's very, very much the kind of guy you want. So I would urge people to check out, and again, noting that I'm very stingy about this sort of thing. I don't just go around with political endorsements, but Sabrin for Senate dot com is the site. It's not the number four. It's Sabrin, F-O-R, Senate dot com. Um, he definitely has the Tom Woods 100 percent seal of approval. Now, I dare say, Murray, that I don't think even you can top that, but say what you will. Well, Tom, I really appreciate it because I've been working on this literally all my adult life since I was, I guess, in my mid-20s. In 1976, uh, I had a letter published in the New York Times about Theses and Hayek and the Gold Standard, and it was the first letter on the uh, editorial page with its own cartoon. And so I'm very proud of that because I explained the Theses Hayek theory of the business cycle in a letter to the editor with its own cartoon where the dollar was carved and uh, looked like gold. So I've been working at this because I appreciate what the Austrians have uh, promulgated over the uh, what uh, almost 150 years since uh, Menger's uh, 1870 book of uh, uh, Principles of Economics, which may, and I really appreciate those kind words. My wife I'd like to say that also because we've been married in August. We'll be married 50 years. So. Uh, uh, she knows who I am. She's stuck with me through thick and thin for 50 years. And I really appreciate those words because going to the United States Senate, uh, uh, Tom, I can tell you, could be a game changer. Not for me personally. I'm, it's not about me. This is about the country and the, and the young people that I've been teaching for the last uh, 30 years. So if people rally behind my campaign, if we meet those thresholds, we will have the most competitive libertarian 
congressional campaign in history, and if lightning should strike on November 5th and I win, uh, then I, I, I think we will have a game changer because then libert- good libertarian candidates will step forward in 2020, and goodness knows what could happen after that. So I see this race not for me personally because my academic career it will continue if I don't make it, but the point is this is an opportunity for the people of the United States to really stand up and say, we think we're in the wrong direction. We want someone to be a voice for our concerns. We want to have peace. We want to have liberty. We want to have prosperity. We want to have a world where nuclear weapons are no longer a threat. That's why I applaud Trump's denuclearization uh, effort. I say, let's do it for the rest of the world, not just the Korean Peninsula. And so everything I learned from Rothbard, from Mises, from Rockwell, from Woods, from Hayek, from Delano, uh, these are the people who influenced my life in the past uh, 45 years. And if we all work together, we can achieve something that people uh, think it's an impossible dream. But I don't think it's an impossible dream if we get the resources that would propel me to the same tier as the Republicans and Democrats. And that's what this is all about, to get a message out of, of peace and harmony and, uh, and make sure that we work together as human beings and not have this identity politics, which is dividing us left and right. And... Uh, Let's talk about the immigration in a way that we can have a, a, a civil discussion as an immigrant. I have some very, uh, uh, not strong views, I would say, but common sense views about immigration that should appeal to everybody. So I think if, uh, if uh, we have the type of support I think we could get in this campaign, like the Libertarians did in 97 for me, I think we'll achieve something, Tom, that uh, will make uh, politics hopefully take a back seat to building this country up again the way it should be because... Uh, uh, when I look at the history of America, it was all about volunteerism. It was about individual initiative. It was about entrepreneurship. It was all about all the things that the authors have been talking about since the 19th century. And that's what I internalized uh, for nearly 50 years. And that's why in the political arena, when you present common sense views to people, they rally around it rather than the rhetoric that you see from both Republicans and Democrats. Well, with that, Murray, we're going to let you get back to the convention Sabrenforsenate.com is the website. Uh, we all wish you the best of luck, and we appreciate that you're out there talking about the issues nobody will talk about and uh, filling in a very, very important gap, which is exactly what Ron Paul did, bringing up exactly the issues you're talking about. So thanks so much. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it, and best of the family. All right, folks, remember a couple things. I'm doing only three episodes this week and next week, and then we'll be back to normal. So that's one thing. Listen to Contra Krugman, my other podcast, in the meantime at ContraKrugman.com. Second thing to tell you is I, again, want to remind you about my good friends at Free Talk Live. they got the largest pro-liberty radio program in the world. They're a panel of libertarians. They take calls from anyone. It's always interesting and edgy. And they're on the same stations that have major liberal and conservative hosts. So they're bringing liberty to an audience that isn't quite in our camp yet. And that's exactly what we need to be doing. So they're very, very much worth listening to. And uh, so I recommend you subscribe to their podcast at listen.freetalklive.com. See you all next week. Become a smarter libertarian in just 30 minutes a day. Visit TomWoods.com to subscribe to the show for free. And we'll see you next time.